Buenas tardes y bienvenidos a esta nueva sesión del, del foro Telos, eh, estas jornadas eh, que bajo el título de Construyendo el Futuro eh, pretenden repensar este eh, presente tan convulso eh, a través de las aportaciones de, de muchos pensadores intelectuales que se están dedicando precisamente, que llevan mucho tiempo eh, pensando sobre los retos a los que nos enfrentamos y los caminos por los que eh, van a discurrir los próximos años. Nuestro invitado de hoy, desde luego, eh, Philip Ball, cumple eh, totalmente esos, esos requisitos. Es eh, un, eh, una persona con un eh, enorme conocimiento científico, pero que también eh, es capaz de lanzar una mirada transversal que a una ciencia y humanidades, eh, como en el convencimiento de que es el, eh, todo el conocimiento humano eh, trabajando al unísono el que eh, podrá lograr las transformaciones para superar los retos a los que nos encontramos. Eh, muchas gracias, Philip, y bienvenido. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. Uh, in the very strange case that uh, Philip Ball uh, needed an introduction, well, I'll try to summarize. Uh, he's a freelance uh, writer, a consultant editor for Nature, where he has worked for over 10 years as an editor for uh, uh, physical sciences, but he has uh, uh, writing about a wide range of topics as cosmology, future, quantum physics, uh, molecular biology, uh, music, art. Uh, I don't know how many books uh, have exactly have you have you written. I don't either, to be honest. I, it depends how you count them. More than 20, let's say. More, more than 20. Well, his last uh, book uh, by now is uh, Cómo crear un ser humano, how to grow a uh, human, uh, as you can see, a very interesting book. And uh, 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 most of their books are uh, published uh, uh, in Turner, uh, in Spanish. Uh, for example, Al Servicio del Rai, Contra Natura, Curiosidad, Cuántica, El Instinto Musical. Well, a lot of topics, a lot of books and Uh, I think uh, this is the reason why we are going to talk about science, but uh, about humanities too, I think. Uh, first of all, uh, Philip, I'd like to, to ask, ask you, uh, science um, is more present these days, uh, these pandemic days everywhere, on the news, on TV, on uh, political debates, uh, on conversations, on subway, in the bar, in the pub, everywhere. Uh, everywhere. Um, after these months, how do you think uh, science is, is doing? Uh, this protagonism uh, is good or bad for it? <laughs> Well, it's certainly a very interesting time for science because for one thing, what we've seen during this pandemic is the way in which science works being on very public display. You know, normally uh, we get to see the public gets to see the results of science once they've been processed and published and sanitized, you could say. Whereas what we've seen here is, you know, science happening in real time with all of the uncertainty uh, and the confusion and the disagreement that that involves. So we've had you know, one of the challenging things, I think, for people to make sense of this pandemic is that the scientists themselves aren't always agreed about how to interpret what has been happening and what is going on and what the dangers are. That's just normal science. That's science as normal. You know, that's how science always happens. But we don't usually get to see that side of things. And, you know, neither do we uh, normally get to see science playing out with such high stakes with, you know, obviously, literally thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives at stake. Um, so it's been a, a, a very interesting, a very challenging time for um, that process of science to unfold. But I'm hoping 
that there will be some good to have come from that in the sense that it will have shown people how science is contingent, how it reaches uh, it, its conclusions, um, you know, how hard it has to work to do that. And I think perhaps also the contrast between that <laughs> and the way things seem to happen in the political arena, where you know, very, very often it seems to be much more about who has the loudest voice. Um, you know that 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 that's who prevails rather than who has the best evidence. And you know, one of the also one of the striking things we've seen in the pandemic is how politics and science have interacted, and how the science itself has been become has become politicized and been used for political ends um, in in various ways. So, you know, I think it's probably overall for, for, for good that the, this process of science has been made evident to people. Um, but I think that it probably has also challenged uh, the common public perception that science delivers the answers, that it has certainty, that there are black and white answers to everything. There clearly aren't in a, in a situation like this. I also hope that it's been a good advert, though, for science, because what scientists have achieved, you know, we are now starting to hear that um, vaccines are becoming available that look like they're working well and that perhaps they might even be available to some, at least, before the end of this year. If that's the case, it will be utterly extraordinary, and I really want that message to be stressed, that never before has a vaccine be, uh, been produced so quickly and yet without losing any of the rigor of the testing that it has to undergo. So it's a really extraordinary effort and a testament to the power of science that, you know, a year ago we didn't even know this, this disease existed and already we're on the, the brink of having a vaccine against it, whereas very often vaccines take years, often decades before they're ready for public use. So it's been an extraordinary um, triumph, I think, of the science, even to have got to this stage, even though, you know, even now there aren't guarantees that the vaccines are all going to work. But it's looking good. And that really is a testament to the power of science. But maybe uh, I don't know if it's a contradiction that you are talking about this success of the, with the vaccines. It, it seems that they are going to, to work. And it's obviously uh, one of the greatest uh, success of the history of the science if, if it happens. But uh, mistrust in science is growing in a, uh, a large uh, portion of the, of the public opinion. It's not, we are uh, uh, watching this success, but uh, uh, there are problems with the trust in science. How is this possible? Well, I think it's complicated. I, I would certainly hesitate to simply say that there has been a growing mistrust of science. Um, and I think, you know, you're, you're probably referring in particular to the concerns that are being raised about the vaccines and whether people are going to take them or not. And it seems there are going to be some serious problems in persuading people that the vaccines are safe to use. I've seen figures of, you know, maybe 50% of Americans, at least, uh, are saying they probably wouldn't wouldn't uh, take a vaccine. But I don't interpret that necessarily as a general distrust of science. I think that what we've seen is that the, the issue has become politicized. And, you know, it seems that um, the, the division between who trusts <laughs> what science is saying about, for example, how effective lockdowns are and how effective masks are and how effective the vaccines will be, and those people who don't, that those seem to divide, not completely, but to a striking degree on poli on political lines. And again, it's, this is particularly clear in, in the US. Um, so there's more to it than simply whether people trust science or not. And probably, I, I suspect, pretty much all of those people, you know, happily use the products of science and in fact trust the products of science when they're using their smartphones or when they're, you know, tweeting about how they're not going to use a vaccine, um, clearly using the products of science. Um, so, you know, I think it, 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 it goes deeper than that, which in some ways means it's going to be harder to address because this is partly a you know a, a crisis of trust in 
fact generally. It's something that has been happening in the political sphere as well, where trust in evidence and fact has been undermined for political reasons in other areas. And I think, um, you know, many people have said, I think quite rightly, that what the pandemic has shown us, it's a bit like it's acted as a lens to focus trends that have been happening over the past several years, perhaps the past decade or so, in particular um, it, with the issue of climate change. Um, you know, many of the people who distrust vaccines and distrust lockdowns and masks and so forth are the same people who distrust um, the evidence for human induced climate change. That can't be any coincidence, but clearly it has, you would imagine, nothing to do with the actual science, with the actual facts, because there's nothing in common with those two uh, situations. So something else is going on. And I think that what we're seeing here is a kind of an acceleration of what we've seen happening with climate change, where the issue is becoming polarized for reasons that really aren't to do with science itself. There, there are other factors involved. And one of those is simply the creation of this whole ecosystem of misinformation that we now have. It's an ecosystem that, it, that you know, it, it, that exists to propagate all kinds of conspiracy theories about other things, about politics in particular. Um, it's being mobilized by, uh, by all sorts of different groups from extremists to spread, you know, anti-Semitic and racist uh, hate messages to um, governments. You know, there's very clear evidence that, for example, the propaganda machine of the Kremlin uh, in Russia is, is part of this. It, you know, feeds back some of these conspiracy theories in order, one assumes, to spread general distrust within democracies. So, you know, there's this whole ecosystem of different people with different agendas um, using often the same channels to spread this misinformation. And the pandemic and climate change and doubtless other issues are swept up along in that and are used for other reasons. So, for example, one starts to see in uh, forums that discuss anti-vaccination, some of which have tended to be, certainly in Europe, have tended to be, you know, environmentalist and quite left and quite sort of liberal. You start to see the appearance of racist tropes there because of the way that kind of messaging has been mobilized by extremist groups. So, you know, I think what it's shown us is that we have a general crisis of actually misinformation and a crisis of fact and believability that some politicians have exploited in order to win elections or to win people onto their side, while at the same time pretending to be concerned about it when it impacts things like, you know, uh, public health programmes. So I think there's a really um, uh, general and actually deeply problematic issue that we need to address here about how to deal with this misinformation, which threatens not only public health, not only, the, you know, the, the future of the climate of the planet, but also the stability of democracies. OK, I'd like to ask you uh, about uh, CRISPR, about this uh, new technique of uh, genoma editing, the recent Nobel Prize uh, to Emmanuel Sarpentiera and Jennifer Dudna uh, has put this technique in the, in the first line. Uh, but Jennifer Dudna has appealed for an international agreement uh, uh, on gene uh, editing because she thinks this is a very powerful technique but it's very it, uh, it may be dangerous too because uh, it opens um, uh, uh, a very uh, wide range of, of uh, possibilities but uh, in your book uh, you are a little uh, skeptic about uh, the possibility of uh, of the uh, manipulate uh, uh, genes uh, very easily in, uh, in near future. Do you think it's more difficult? Uh, some people say. Uh, what do you think will be the, the, the near future about uh, uh, genoma editing? 
Right. Well, yes, as you say, so CRISPR is this technique for editing genomes, including our own genomes, um, which means, you know, that we can transform one gene or uh, into another. We can snip out very, very accurately, more accurately than, than previously, a particular gene or a particular section of the genome and perhaps replace it with another. Um, I mean, it's worth saying that techniques like this go back a long way. But CRISPR, which was devised um, around sort of in the, in the past decade, really, has, has really revolutionized revolutionized the field because it is in general it's more accurate than what we used to have and so it makes uh conceivable at least this this whole notion that we can edit our our genomes now why would we want to do that well the the there, there are possibilities for genetic medicine so you know the hope is that for certain genetic diseases and in particular diseases that perhaps are caused by the mutation of a single gene um, so diseases like, for example, cystic fibrosis, that it might be possible um, to, if uh, a, an embryo is created for IVF by someone who knows or a couple who know that they are carriers for that genetic mutation, then it is possible to test that embryo to see if it carries the mutation that will cause the disease and then to use the, a method like CRISPR to uh, snip out that, if you like, that defective gene and replace it with the one that works properly. And then the embryo can continue to develop. So that's the idea. And, you know, this um, is already becoming a possibility. Certainly we have the methods uh, already in use for testing embryos this way to see if they carry genetic mutations. I should say that, that at the moment that's generally used for selecting embryos. So that, for example, you, you know, you might have four or five of them and you might be looking for one that doesn't contain the the disease mutation that you can then use for implantation for IVF but if you can repair the gene that's damaged um, that's faulty then you know that gives you even more possibilities and it, it looks very probable that that this um, will be uh, will become used in medicine for those sorts of diseases and, you know, it really has to be stressed that diseases like this, they can be horrible. Um, they can often be, be lethal, but they're often rare as well, that rather few diseases are caused by a mutation in a single gene. Um, many of the most common problems that, uh, we, you know, we might all face, heart disease, uh, for example, or, or um, uh, Alzheimer's or whatever, um, that when they have a genetic component, um, it often involves many genes. And so this is one of the limitations of this sort of technology, that if you have lots of genes involved, I mean, some might have, you know, a hundred genes involved. If that's the case, it no longer becomes feasible to see how you can edit all of those genes using CRISPR to do something about the disease, because those genes won't be doing just a single thing to do with the disease. If there are a hundred or so of them, they look, they'll have various roles. And if you change uh, uh, all of those genes, you don't know what the effects will be. In fact, it's almost at the moment impossible to know what the effects will be um, for other aspects of, of development. So no one is seriously thinking at the moment that this will be a feasible way to deal with gene to deal with diseases like that that have you know that that that, that uh, involve many genes. Um, so, you know, that's that's one of the limitations. Um, and uh, th this is also why I am skeptical in my, my book about why techniques like this, genome editing, will be used to influence things that are often talked about when we talk about designer babies, like intelligence. You know, can we use genome editing to create more intelligent babies? Well, at the moment, um, we know that there is a genetic component to intelligence. In fact, it's quite a strong one. Something around the region of 50% of our uh, intelligence, or the, uh, I should say, 50% of the variation in intelligence that we find within people seems to have a genetic origin. So the rest, you know, we're not quite sure where it comes from. Maybe it comes from uh, the environment. Maybe it comes from things that happen by chance as the brain grows. But about 50% is genetic. Um, however, uh, there's no single intelligence gene, and nor are there any genes that we found so far that have a really strong influence by themselves on intelligence. The best we've seen are genes that influence maybe one or two percent of that variation individually. So, and there may be hundreds of them. 
So again, we don't know how uh, to, to edit for intelligence. And if we try to do it with hundreds or so of those genes, we can be sure that also, you know, what happens with, with uh, CRISPR is you get some off target editing. So you, uh, it, no matter how accurate it is, there'll always be some sort of margin for it going wrong and snipping out the wrong gene. And we don't know what the knock on effects of that would be either. So you don't want to do it for loads of genes. So, you know, for, for, for this reason, there's no uh, real reason to think that genome editing could be used to alter the intelligence of embryos and create, you know, more intelligent designer babies. There's also the question of um, whether you, you should, whether you can ethically do this at all, whether you should ethically um, manipulate the genome uh, of an embryo so that not only is uh, that embryo, that, that the, the person that will grow from that embryo, not only is the, are their genes changed, but so will be um, the genes of any of their offspring. This is so-called germline editing, which is inherited by all successive generations. And the concern is that we, sh we should think very hard before we do that. Because, you know, if there are knock on effects, you're not just affecting a single person, but potentially generations of people. There was a general consensus amongst people working in this area that for this reason, we should refrain from editing the germline at this stage, um, you know, using genome editing for reproductive purposes in this way. But that has been challenged by the fact that uh, at the end of 2018, a Chinese biologist went ahead without proper permission and you used CRISPR to edit the genome of embryos that were then used for IVF and get, were, were um, developed to give birth to two uh, baby girls. The scientist used it to edit a gene that he thought would confer protection of those babies against infection by HIV, which causes AIDS. So not only was this, uh, you know, done without proper regulation, it seems, without proper consent, but it wasn't even being done to address an existing medical problem, but only one that had been anticipated in the future. So for all sorts of reasons, this was a very bad idea, plus the fact that it was actually done very clumsily, it seems. Um, and this this action was, you know, almost universally condemned. And the scientist involved has now been given a prison sentence in China for violating the regulations. But it did show that there was no obstacle in principle to using CRISPR in IVF uh, to create uh, embryos that can then, you know, be grown full term and give birth to what seem to be otherwise healthy babies. So it's kind of, you know, you could say open the floodgates and there are now people who are want to, who are applying for permission to do this in, in other ways um, now that we know it's possible. So there are, you know, now really quite urgent uh, discussions, international discussions going on for what sort of framework we need to properly and safely and ethically regulate these technologies before we press ahead with them. And I think that's entirely proper and, in fact, necessary. Yes, maybe, maybe the problem, the problem is, is that, that it's um, um, uh, easy, easy and cheap and technique that uh, a lot of people can use, not necessarily in a big uh, laboratory or with a big uh, budget. So I suppose this is a difference uh, uh, between CRISPR and the previous uh, uh, techniques. Well, I wouldn't want to... Um underestimate <laughs> the difficulty um you know in in a sense it's cheap but you do need good, real expertise to do it well and in fact this is you know one of the things we've learned from the the the, the, the chinese uh experiment that um the the guy who did that um Oi. You know, I think we, we, we shouldn't uh, assume that it's too easy um, to do this you do, or, or certainly to do it well. Um, and, you know, it's partly for that reason, too, that I think it's very important that it be regulated so that we prevent these sort of clumsy efforts to do something and to do it badly. Because, you know, I think the real uh, worry here, um, and I think this is what's so often overlooked in these discussions of whether science should do something or not, the, the, the real worry for me is not so much what science makes possible, but the fact that it plays out 
in a, a, a free market um, environment, in a capitalistic environment. Um, and, uh, you know, it immediately creates the potential for abuses for people who want to make money. We see this happening already in um, other areas. I mean, it's certainly happening in IVF uh, in area in, in the USA, for example, where that's, you know, fertility treatments are hardly regulated. And uh, there are some clinics, fertility clinics that make all kinds of claims. But we're also starting to see it happen in other areas of what is called stem cell technology, where the embryonic stem cells, the ones that uh, are present in embryos, then that can grow into any kind of tissue. Um, these two are being explored for medical uses, you know, for, for, for regrowing uh, tissues or repairing damage to our tissues in our, in our own bodies. And there are all kinds of uh, fantastic possibilities for that. But we're starting to see, and this has happened particularly in, um, in East Asia, in Korea and in Japan, uh, clinics appear that are promising all kinds of things that they can do with stem cell technologies that haven't been properly regulated, haven't been properly tested, and will essentially prey on vulnerable people who are desperate for treatments and will pay you know, a large amount for something that may well not do them any good at all and quite possibly might do them some harm. So that's you know why I think we need regulation, not because there are hordes of irresponsible scientists out there, although you know clearly there are some, um, but because uh, we we just see and uh, you know exploitation uh, naturally appear in a free market system unless we have regulation to curtail it. So you know that's really what we need to look out for. Uh... I like to uh, to ask you in your book Contra Natura. Uh, you said something like uh, this: that uh, the difference between artificial and natural is um, is not uh, uh, exactly. Uh, you say that this is an idea that Aristotle. Uh, introduced in uh, in the occidental thinking, and you say that uh, all the humans uh, do uh, are natural because we are uh, natural beings. Uh, human being is natural being. So, you think that this um, distinction between uh, natural and artificial uh, is a problem to to understand. All, all these issues, uh, the, uh, all the genetics, the IVF, uh, all these kind of, of techniques. Uh, uh, do you think this is a problem in, in the Western mentality, the difference between uh, artificial and natural? Yes, and I think it, it goes back a long way and it, it, it's very deep seated and as you say in that book i was exploring that idea the book in english it was called unnatural um and uh it was exploring what we mean by that term and in particular exploring it within the context of uh technologies that you could consider to be making human beings in some way um and uh I, I what I suggested um, was that well, first of all, that you know we often hear talk about um, the some of these assisted reproduction technologies being unnatural, and that was certainly something that was said about IVF when it was when it first appeared. Many people uh, were very wary of it or disapproving of it because they considered it to be an unnatural technology. And nowadays, you know, we've kind of got used to it, but now there's something else that we consider to be unnatural, uh, whether it's stem cell technologies or genome editing or, or, you know, some of the other possibilities that have come along. And um, what, what struck me in, in looking at those kinds of issues is how the same arguments and the same kind of imagery, imagery always appeared. You always hear, for example, that these are Frankenstein technologies. Um, and, you know, I think the, the the book, Mary Shelley's novel, was a fantastic exploration of what it meant, of what, what where those uh, preconceptions and prejudices came from and where they, where they lead. Um, but in general, when we hear that term, you know, a Frankenstein technology, or when we hear a, an unnatural technology, we're not simply being told, this is different from what is natural, from what happens in nature. We're being invited to disapprove of it. 
unnatural has a negative connotation. Um, and, you know, why is that? Um, and I do think that it goes back, uh, you can trace it back to this very ancient prejudice against what human beings make as opposed to, as some people would have said and still would say, what God has made, what, it, what, what, what is in nature. And um, it, it was a discussion that the ancient Greeks like uh, Aristotle and Plato had. Plato, in fact, was uh, famously very um, suspicious of the arts. Um, and uh, by, by that, he means anything that is human created. So, you know, art, the arts back then could mean um, making metals by, you know, metallurgy or creating machines, not necessarily painting pictures. All of that, he said, was uh, just a kind of cheap imitation of nature. And so we should be wary of it. It's superficial. Um, and, you know, I think that that prejudice uh, carries through in Western philosophy. And in particular, it became, you know, e all the more important once uh, once Christianity became the dominant mode of thinking um, in the West, uh, because now the, the idea was not just that what is artificial, what is human made is kind of uh, somehow inferior to what is in nature. It's inferior because God made uh, nature, and so that is by definition perfect. We, you know, all we can do is is a sort of poor imitation of that. And also, there's the suspicion, particularly when it comes to making humans, uh, as people talked about, even in the Middle Ages, that what you're doing is not just inferior but blasphemous. It's impious to try to do this, to try to do what only God could do. And so there was, again, this sort of negative uh, the idea, this negative connotation to uh, to the arts. And we still see it today. You know, to call something synthetic is to sort of say it's not very good. It's kind of inferior. That's just as, you know, that's just a sort of synthetic fabric. It's not as good as the natural as natural cotton or something to call something artificial you know, is to sort of denigrate it often. Um, so, you know, these terms have have acquired these these negative connotations. And I think that's something that our technologies have often struggled against, um, particularly chemical technologies, um, that something that is, you know, uh, made by some chemical process rather than extracted from is seen as synthetic and therefore not good enough. Um, so if, for example, you extract vitamin C from some natural, you know, or if you, you are a chemist and you make synthetic vitamin C, the same molecule, um, th that people w won't sort of feel the same way very often about them. You can use, you know, the techniques of chemistry to show they are exactly the same molecule. But one is considered synthetic and inferior and a little bit suspect. Um, and, you know, again, I think this is an element of why there is suspicion against uh, uh, vaccines that are clearly going to be made by an artificial or a chemical process. Um, and so somehow, uh, you know, aren't going to give you the same kind of protection that you would get from, you know, natural immunity. So I think that this is something that we, we that, that, the, the sciences and our technologies struggle against. And I guess in that book, I wanted to bring it out into the open and to bring it out into the open quite, you know, quite generally, but also in terms of in this sphere of uh, assisted reproduction technologies so that when a new technique comes along, um, we can have, I would hope, a more sort of grown up and honest and clear discussion about it and recognize that there are all sorts of prejudices from the past that we will probably be carrying into that discussion. Um, in your books, there is a topic um, uh, always present that is um, a vision uh, that includes uh, humanities and science. You don't uh, separate one of another. For example, in your book about color, uh, la invención del, del color, uh, you say that uh, we can't understand the history of art without uh, knowing when uh, the, some uh, elements, some pigment, some uh, uh, another technique, uh, technical uh, of art uh, was possible, but in the history of the art, the academic history 
of art, nobody talks about about these things. Do you think it's necessary to uh, re-elaborate um, an, uh, a vision of the culture that includes science and uh, uh, humanities, with, uh, we can say humanities, uh, for the Zoom, and as a as a whole, because the uh, relations uh, between uh, one and another is always present and conditionate, but uh, one and another uh, does. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think that they are um, to to some extent. Uh, there's no reason to deny that they are distinct disciplines, that the techniques that are used in science um, are often quite different from the techniques that are used in the humanities. I mean, not by no means always. Um, I think both are concerned with, uh, you know, establishing some criteria for truth or for reliability. Both are concerned with looking at the evidence uh, that is there. But, you know, I don't, I wouldn't want to force a sort of an artificial um, union between them. I think my real point is that, first of all, uh, there is absolutely no reason for them to be antagonistic to one another. And secondly, that for some of the topics and some of the questions that interest us most, most uh, we need both to understand, uh, to understand them. So, for, you know, in, in my book about colour, um, I, I had seen books that sort of approach colour from a scientific angle and talk about the wavelengths of light and about how the visual system works and, and, and so forth. All of that is clearly relevant to understanding colour. Um, it's never going to be the whole story if we want to understand, you know, why artists have used colour and how they thought about colour. Um, it's something that I think they uh, would benefit from knowing about and many artists have known about it and have wanted to find out about the science of color um but that's uh, by no means the whole story and i think p perhaps this was particularly true also in my book the music instinct where um you know i'd often seen the same kind of thing this kind of division between critics who talk about musical influences and you know um what a composer was thinking when he or she wrote what they did and people talking about the acoustics of music. And um, it, it seemed a great shame that those two always seem to be separate worlds and that actually to appreciate music, it's worth trying to bring them together. And in particular, uh, they, I think they come together when we try to understand what is going on in our brains when we listen to and appreciate music. Um, some of that can be made scientific. Um, you know, we, we can do experiments and tests to find out what it is about, say, a particular piece of music that triggers people into having an emotional response to it. We can make measurements of what their brains are, are doing, what the activity in their brains is, what bits of the brain they are using. We can see, for example, that for some uh, uh, structures in music, they will trigger um, within the brain, the same kind of response that gets triggered when we hear a grammatical error in speech or read it in, you know, in written uh, language. And so, you know, we're using some of the same, uh, it seems the same circuitry in our brains to process language and to process music. Um, I think that's interesting. I think that tells us something about, you know, how, uh, how we're responding to music. Um, but I don't think that we're ever going to fully appreciate uh, what it is about a piece of music that moves us and what we feel about it um, by taking brain scans um, or by, you know, testing people in a laboratory with different sort of tones on a in a tone generator to find out how they respond. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I was interested there and in the, the invention of colour, I was interested in really trying to integrate the science of the subject and what we know about it and being honest about what we don't know about it with the with the cultural history and um the 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 artistry of it um and i you know i i think that that's really the only way that we can hope to start to gain a a a, a, a proper and satisfying picture of what it is in the art generally that uh, we respond to and what it is that the arts are doing to create that response and uh, another uh, 
uh, thing that they share is curiosity. Curiosity is the motor of science and, and art and culture too. Yeah, um, I, I, so uh, this is a, a book that was simply called Curiosity and I can't exactly remember how it came about now, but I do recall thinking, you know, that ve very often uh, it, it, it's very um, common in, in sciences for people to talk about the value of curiosity and to have, you know, an open mind and curiosity being a sort of motor of scientific innovation. All of that, I think, is true. And people talk about curiosity driven research, which doesn't have a particular agenda of, you know, being a, a particular device, but it's just an exploration of what happens if I do this and how it's very important in science that we support that kind of research where you don't quite know where it's going or what the objective is going to be. All of that I agree with, but what I wanted to explore in, in, uh, in my book is where this notion of curiosity, how it, how it arose in history um, and to show that actually it was more complicated uh, than the normal story we we, we, we tell about it. Um, it has meant different things at different times and it's been regarded in different ways at different times. So in the Middle Ages, many people, certainly theologians, were suspicious of curiosity because it, the connotation was that it meant looking into things that you really had no right to look into. Um, wanting to know more than you really should or that God, than that God meant us to. And of course, you know, one could say that curiosity, uh, the story of curiosity goes right back to the Garden of Eden, um, that actually it was, you know, that desire for, for knowledge um, that tempted Eve. It was also, it also goes back to the, you know, the, the, the story of, of, uh, of Prometheus the, the, in Greek mythology, that it was that, uh, you know, that, that wish for knowledge and for asking questions that um, that got that uh, got Prometheus into into trouble for giving that 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 impulse to to humankind. So it's had a difficult history, and I I uh, argued in the book that it was really in the in the 17th century what sometimes is called the scientific revolution that curiosity became liberated, that it became okay, in fact a good thing to be curious. Um, and it's really striking if you simply um, look at the number of times the word curiosity appears in, uh, you know, books written throughout time. Um, there's this huge change in about the middle of the 17th century, right when we normally say the scientific revolution was happening. Um, that, you know, there, it really looks like the word became liberated and it became OK to, to use it um, and to ask any question. Um, and in, instead of expecting to find the answers, um, you know, in, in ancient books, uh, you, you, you would ask it and try to find the answers by experimentation. I mean, I should say that didn't suddenly happen in the 17th century. There's a longer history than that. But it's in the 17th century that suddenly it seems all of this comes together. You see these scientific societies like the Royal Society in, in, in London um, and societies uh, in Italy as well start to appear. Uh, where, which brought together like-minded people who had this desire to know. Um, and it wasn't necessarily a challenge to, to the religious condemnation of curiosity. Some of those people were profoundly religious, but they would argue that it, we actually had a duty to find out all we could about this amazing world that God had created. So curiosity was sort of enlisted <laughs> in the service of God by, by some. Um, but that at the same time, often the people who were doing that, they did have some agenda. For Francis Bacon, um, who was one of, you know, meant to be one of the sort of founders of this, uh, this, this sort of revolution in asking questions, for him, it was all about amassing uh, knowledge as an engine of state power. The more you knew that you could feed it into the, the, the sort of machinery of the state for creating engines of war, for example, of creating you know, better navigation systems and for expanding state power that way. So that was really what lay at the bottom of it. And, you know, I think we still see that motivation um, in the space race. 
that often you know the argument that is made for, that is put forward for it uh, and certainly has been you know during the apollo times was well it's an it's a quest to find out more about the universe to get out there and to explore for some people it absolutely was but there can be i think no denying that the main engine of the the the, the space race and the apollo missions was a uh, conflict it was cold war conflict and you know who could uh, develop this technology first so what i suggest in the book is that although we should embrace curiosity it's clearly a valuable thing and valuable thing for humanity to have we should interrogate our agendas very closely when we start to talk about it and ask what you know whether it's there isn't really something else behind it i'd like to know uh, another question uh, if when you write your book in spanish uh, quantica uh, where beyond uh, about quantum physics uh, without uh, equations, without uh, mathematics, uh, symbols. Uh, did you suffer uh, uh, very much uh, writing about this difficult uh, topic, uh, even for, for many scientists? Uh, quantum physics is maybe uh, one of the most uh, strange uh, um, uh, discipline for the for the general public yeah well um i i i put it this way that for not just for me i think for most um for, for real quantum physicists the mathematics is the easy part um i mean the mathematics is is tough i'm not you know there's no point in denying that if you're not mathematically inclined but you know where you are with it. You know how to do it. You know how to, you know which equations you use. You know how to manipulate them, how to feed in, you know, your data and get an answer out, a prediction for how your quantum device is going to work or how your quantum experiment is going to ha is going to turn out. And it works. So, you know, we had quantum, ma quantum mechanics is a mathematical theory that is probably the best tested scientific theory we have it works fantastically well so we don't for the questions that i wanted to ask we don't actually need the maths um you know you don't you, we can almost take that for granted the question the problem that we have and that we've wrestled with for a hundred years ever since quantum mechanics was was devised is what the maths is really telling us about the nature of the world we know that the maths is telling us something about what we can expect to see it allows us to make predictions but what is it revealing about what is causing those those effects and this is what scientists physicists have have argued about from the beginning and are still arguing about as vigorously as ever now and the problem is that the maths is kind of silent <laughs> that it doesn't tell us um you know about the meaning of these things um some people think it does some people and some people say well the meaning is in the maths why do you need to worry about these philosophical questions you know j just show the equations it's all there um to me and i think to a lot of people that that would be profoundly unsatisfying because I, well i think it's avoiding the issue really i think it's avoiding the issue of what is the stuff underneath this maths because you know normally that's um Normally, I, I guess the, the, the relation between a mathematical theory and the world, <laughs> the, the reality as we know it, it's kind of clear in science. You know, if we write out um, an equation to describe the motion of a ball that we throw, we use Newton's laws of mechanics to do that. And the maths will tell us the trajectory, the path that the ball will take through space. And it's kind of clear what the maths means. It just is telling us that path. Um, in quantum mechanics, we don't we can't quite do that we can't uh, describe the path something will take what we get instead is something that looks kind of more smeared out we get the probabilities that we'll find an object in any particular location if we choose to look that sounds like kind of the same thing but a bit smeared out but actually it's it's profoundly different because what it's telling us is what we will see if we choose to look and that's really weird that it's not telling us anything about what is there unless we look. And so <laughs> that's really the question that I'm trying to, that I was trying to delve into in quantum physics. You know, can we say anything uh, about what is there before we look? 
this is really the, um, the the central question, the central problem of the philosophy of quantum mechanics, um, because the theory doesn't pronounce on that. It just tells us what we will see if we look. Um, and it's really unique as a, a scientific theory in, in doing that, in confining itself to that. So this is, you know, that's where the arguments start. But uh, I, I really wanted to, to make sure in that book that I didn't fall back on, rely on the mathematics, or I think hide behind the mathematics to get away from those difficult questions. I think that's really the, the my concern that, you know, very often uh, in science, um, scientists hide behind the mathematics. And if you ask them, well, what's really going on there? It becomes a bit harder to explain. And in quantum mechanics, it's not just a bit harder. It's actually a profoundly difficult philosophical question to, to answer that question once you put aside the mathematics and try to talk about what it is that you're really talking about. Yes, um, we have time for the last uh, question. Uh, do you think that the problem is that, uh, the, for example, um, in, the, in, in the schools, uh, the children uh, the, don't learn enough mathematics or scientific uh, concepts to understand uh, these things. For example, now with the pandemic, maybe if the if the people uh, had a, a very uh, um, uh, most uh, knowledge, scientific knowledge, uh, they understand. Uh, better what is happening do you think that there is a problem the the lack of of uh, scientific uh, culture in in the general people i'm i'm wary of coming to that conclusion for, for several reasons one is that i think it's always been said it's certainly been said um for the past 150 years that you know oh people are just too ignorant about science um and th this is the, the cause of our, our all our problems um but also i think that that it that's really what is sometimes called the deficit model of science communication that um you know, our problem is that there's this kind of um, uh, absence of scientific knowledge, this kind of hole that we have to fill with facts, with scientific facts. And once we've done that enough, it will all be fine. And, you know, everyone else will agree with what we scientists think um, because they'll have the same facts as us. And, you know, that doesn't seem to work. And I think we can see in this pandemic that um, it's not as simple as that, that actually I, I, I kind of think... Um, you know, many people are, they're, they're smarter than they're often given credit for. They may lack um, knowledge of detailed facts about, you know, how viruses spread or how vaccines work or something. Um, but we shouldn't confuse that lack of uh, detailed knowledge with stupidity or ignorance. Um, it's that, you know, those aren't the same thing. And in fact, it's often <laughs> people who have, a, you know, quite a significant degree of education who are coming out with the most extraordinary, um, incorrect, misleading statements about vaccines and about, you know, the nature of the, the problems that we face with the pandemic. So there's something else um, going on. And often I think it's other agendas that are creating, you know, those those sorts of problems, not just a, uh, not just an ignorance of the facts. Um, but I think also that um, th there's, you know, what, what I do sometimes see, and I think it's always kind of been this way in education, that I, I, I sort of feel like there's a, a tendency to uh, make it formulaic to sort of imagine that, you know, what we have to do is to uh, explain to kids the different parts of a cell and the different parts of the year and they have to be able to recite Newton's laws and then they're kind of scientifically educated. And I think that, you know, some of that uh, is valuable, but actually probably not as much as we think. I think that the essence of what uh, people really should be educated in is, is much simpler than that. Um, that uh, it's really about, a, a, for, for one thing, it's about a, a mode of thinking of how we evaluate what we're told, how we evaluate truths about the world, how we think about the world um, in, in a scientific sense. 
I, um, for several years, uh, my partner and I were educating our children at home, home educating, and uh, it forced me to think, well, what it is, what is it then, given that my time is limited in what I can impart to my kids, what is it I really want them to know? And it was a great an opportunity to focus my thought about that and I thought well actually it boils down to rather few questions if you understand these questions um, and I boiled it down to three questions one for chemistry one for physics one for biology if you under really understand those questions and uh, in, in the sense that you understand how to ask them how to frame them in a particular situation um, and what they really mean then I think you know you'd have a higher degree of scientific literacy than a lot of people who cram their heads with facts and are able to pass exams and then it's all gone but you know within a year of them passing their exams so you know i i think that it, it, perhaps there's a you know a case for really thinking how we rethinking the approach to education to 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 try to to try to show that it's really about learning how to learn and learning how to think rather than learning what to learn and what to think. Okay, so I'm afraid time is over, not the topics. The topics aren't over at all, but thank you very much for this for this conversation and always for your your clarity and your inspiring inspiring ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Great to talk to you. Thank you so much.